I know I've been gone. It's Dr. Jay Rutland. Welcome back to Medicine Deconstructed. But I don't even know why I'm talking. Hi guys, I'm Jamie's wife, and we thought we'd switch it up a little bit today and get a little personal. Welcome, Welcome to, to Medicine, Medicine Deconstructed. Deconstructed. Jamie's been a little bit absent, especially from YouTube. Um, we had kind of a major life event. If you guys follow him on Instagram, you obviously know that I was diagnosed with breast cancer um, right before Christmas. And I am here today to talk a little bit about my story. When you got diagnosed, tell me, tell me how you first found out that you or thought you might have breast cancer. So it all started, I was um, cooking dinner in my neighbor's kitchen. I was not doing the normal breast exam that they tell you to do. In fact, I never do. Um, and I just randomly had a little itch and was like, oh, there's a little something there that I hadn't noticed before. And my neighbor was like, oh, it's nothing. And I was like, oh, it's nothing. I'm 36, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm active, I eat well, I'm, you know, I take good care of myself, so it couldn't possibly be anything. So I let it go, and I let it go for at least two months, and it didn't go away. I didn't, I wasn't sick, so I didn't think it was like a lymph node, it, it, it just, it didn't move. So I thought, I have great health insurance, right? I have two little girls. So those were my motivating factors to be like, what the heck, it's dumb not to. So I went in and saw my doctor, and as much as I love her, she also was very much like, I really don't think it's anything, but let's go and get an ultrasound just in case. And so at that point I was like, of course, you probably don't wanna hear this, but I went down the Google rabbit hole and I was like, what percentage of, you know, People are actually, and it's like super, a, a low percentage. And again, the fact that I have great health insurance, I was like, it's dumb for me not to follow through. So I went in and they immediately took me back for a mammogram, which threw me off because that was super awkward and I had never had one. And also scared me a little because I was like, I feel like this is really serious. So anyway, so they did the mammogram I told the tech, I was like, I feel so silly because this is probably nothing and you probably see way worse things. And during it, she's like, you definitely shouldn't feel silly. I definitely see something. Can't tell you what it is, obviously, I don't know, but um, you're not, you, you know, you're not silly for being here. So that made me, that actually made me feel good. So then we went in and did the ultrasound the same day. And um, it, they could see something on the ultrasound. They weren't sure what it was. I do my normal like, well, what what percentage is it? Nothing. Like, what is your like thought process? Mm -hmm. Is it? Are you ninety five percent sure? And the doc was like, I'm pretty, I'm pretty positive it's nothing. But at that point, she had told me all of this. And she was a person that went in, got the ultrasound. She immediately went for mammogram, which is something that, like, I had never heard of, right? I mean, that's not something that's... But, but from, from what I was told, that's normal practice. I just, I wasn't disclosed that up front, so it automatically mm. boosted my anxiety, right? So anyway, during the ultrasound, um, she was like, well, there's just a couple, like, concerning little things. So we're just, you know, I really don't think it's anything, but... Let's do a biopsy. So then I'm like, okay, I'm you know now I'm like a little more elevated on the anxiety on the anxiety front. Um, so I go back a couple days later. I get the biopsy done. Jamie is there with me, although they wouldn't let him in because of COVID. Even though he, I was pissed about he, that, he tried really hard. <laughs> 
So he's in the waiting room and I go in for the biopsy. They basically go, my lump was here. So they basically went through this way. They numb you up really well. And then they insert a larger needle to, I don't know what it was, something that clamped the tumor, right? So I don't know if I just was a little unlucky in that moment, but the first one hurt really bad. And I don't know if it just didn't take, I, who knows? Anyway, they gave me a little bit more medicine and the, the next three like clamps were totally fine. But again, I, I asked the doctor again, what do you think? What are the odds? What are the chances? You know, she was like, I really don't know, but I really don't think it's anything. So maybe I don't know if that's just her normal way or what, but um, the, the ladies were so sweet. It was all women up in, like I was dealing with all women. So I went out to the waiting room and I, and I lost it. I mean, <laughs> I might lose it now. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. So she comes out, she's in the waiting room and then we, um, talk for a minute and you can tell that she's just emotionally a little bit, um, different. And so we talk about what happened. Um, we talk about her being numb or not being numb and going through with the biopsy. And then at that point, it's kind of like a waiting game because I think that weekend. Yeah, it was. So that weekend we went to Big Bear, which was awesome. We had already planned this like trip with friends and or his brother and our sister-in-law and the, a set of close friends and kids. And it was great. We went and like went um, snow tubing and hiking and just did the whole like winter, mm -hmm. winter fun. The kids had a blast and it was cold and hot chocolate, all the good stuff. Right. So it was, it was nice, but it was a waiting game. It was a waiting game. Like I was thinking about it the whole weekend. Right. But she was doing a good job showing us that she wasn't thinking about it. Your husband works in medicine. He's a doctor. How long did it take after you first felt the lump? to even bring it up to him? Maybe a month in, I think I said something and he did. He was like, that's a little weird, you know? And we didn't, we didn't really, neither one of us acted on it really. I think again, like my age, my, you know, I have one maternal aunt that had breast cancer, but really it wasn't like, I wasn't hugely genetically predisposed, it didn't feel. And again, just being healthy and, whatever so but then you know the, the next month we both were kind of like what you know just go go get it checked talk about like what you feel was preventing you from really looking into it i'm a relaxed person in general i don't get like i don't have much anxiety about like health stuff i feel like i take care of myself so i'm not like things don't make me nervous i'm pretty much it's nothing it's nothing it's nothing but in this case i do say like Fear, fear guided me. Like fear pushed me to go and get checked. I have two little girls, and that was what like I was like. And maybe if I was, if I didn't have kids, maybe I would have let it go. I don't know, but I was thinking about them 100. percent So I think it's hard. I think it might be harder for the emotional side to come out because he is so clinical, you know. But he was he was really good. Like when I. And he even nailed it. He said, you're triggered by like pain. When I feel like pain, it triggers my emotions because I'll keep everything kind of buried. But he noticed that. And then he's, so he's been able to like really kind of know when I'm going to be at my like low point or whatever. On the other front, the medical front, like when we found out, we found out after Big Bear, we got home Sunday evening, we put the kids to bed. He couldn't wait to look and clearly he has access to like the records so he looked up my records and i could just see him like staring at the computer and he was i mean he was great obviously it was an, it was an emotional thing finding out um but you know what like an hour later we talked to all of our oncology friends all of our radio radiology oncology friends you know i had an oncologist lined up in the morning i had the, like the best breast surgeon, the best plastic surgeon, you know, that we, that was recommended to us. 
So I feel like that took a huge weight off of me, the fact that he was able to put on the doctor hat. Yeah. That you was, know? I mean, in those like, that five to 12 minute stretch, like when you are like reading this pathology report, I read pathology reports like all the time. Like I'm always looking at path reports. Most of the time I'm looking under the microscope with the pathologist. But like this time you're reading this path report and it's based on a piece of tissue that comes from your wife's body. And so you have to both like receive, absorb, and deliver all of this news like simultaneously, right? Because you have to be both like, like in that sense, I'm the physician, I'm the husband, you know, I'm the, you know, I'm the next doctor that reads it other than the pathologist that read it. And so it's just kind of like you're looking at everything and you see like, you know, invasive ductal carcinoma, um, this grade, KI-67, you know, you see all of these things, all these things that you kind of know because you've gone through, you know, the gauntlet of learning how to be a physician. But like now you got to interpret it and like understand what it means for your wife while also figuring out a plan of care for your wife. So it's like in my head while I'm while I'm staring at the screen, it's like I'm just putting it all together. I got to you know, you got to receive the bad news. We got to receive the bad news. And then you have to act on the bad news. And I got to do this all within 5 to 12 minutes because I have to make sure that she's comfortable as a patient, as a wife so we can move forward. Because typically speaking, whenever we have these kinds of scenarios with our family members, I kind of know how to act. I kind of know what needs to happen next. I mean, there's her mom had lung cancer once and we kind of went through the similar thing and we got her operated on within a week and all of that jazz. This was during fellowship. But I mean, it's just like, it was a different feeling. But for five to 12 minutes there, I was completely inconsolable. Like it, it was, it was very, it was very difficult period. But then like, she's like, hello, like, you know, me, like it's my body. Like we had to go through this. And that was the, uh, that was the, it was hard. It was very, it was, I'm surprised that she's saying like he did well from a husband's standpoint, because like I had to like cut off the emotions of being a husband and just be like a doctor for a minute. Cause then I called David Amy. Yeah, but you still, you were still like, I mean, I could feel you feel, you know what I mean? Yes. Like yeah. that, you, you were able to do both at one time. How did you guys uh, bring this up with your children? How did you discuss it with them? You know, it's funny. So we, we actually had debates. I thought they could handle it. I thought they could handle knowing like the full truth. And I also felt like they're young, you know, we we still undress, they're going to ask questions, they're going to notice, you know, it's not like we can say nothing's happening. Um, I also am very active with them and there's a lot I'm not going to be able to do. Um, and also like, I, I think kids are, I think it's just kind of how you present it to them, you know? Um, and my feeling was they can handle it. And I even asked, um, I asked Amelia one night, I said, what does is, what is, uh, daddy do for a living? Like, who are his patients? We know, he, we know he works with COVID patients. What other kind of patients? She's like, A people with asthma. And I was like, right. And then like, what other kind of patients? People with cancer. And does that scare you? What do you know about cancer? And she's like, no, not really. So-and-so had cancer and they're just fine. And I was like, exactly. Like, I think they can totally handle it. And it's just how we present it. But I was that was after our yeah, debate. That was after our debate. I was more of like, I don't want to use the word cancer. I don't care what you say to the kids. Just don't say the word cancer. You can say there's badness. You can say that there's some tissue. I just didn't want to use that word because it can be a scary word. Yeah, I think for a kid, I thought it was a scary word. And I was impressed, quite frankly, with my eight year old. And we're, we're all impressed with our kids. Like, don't get it twisted. I understand that. But like, I was quite impressed with how she was able to process that part because then she was like to me, like oh so you go in there you cut it out and it's done and i was like yeah i mean basically well what do you say jamie that maybe there's a little projection in that for you because of all the people in your house you're the person who comes face to face with bad outcomes from cancer more than anyone it's so funny because you like you know the plan you know what's next you know what's gonna happen um and it sounds easy <laughs> it's not right i mean like 
all the decisions you have to make. I, you know, and it was, like, this is like the, probably the first time where I've like actually talked about this out loud, but it's not my time to do that. It's her time. So what should someone do if their wife or mother or sister or daughter is in Dory's position? What is, what, what should they advocate for? I felt all, all of my normal feelings that you feel when you have something like this happen. But also, I felt like I felt a lot of guilt. I felt angry because, I mean, this whole 2020, we've been talking about like privilege, you know, medical disparities and all this stuff. And I felt guilty because I, I was so lucky to be in my position that I was. And I felt angry for like moms that are out there that don't have the same resources that I do, um, that may have not followed through because they were told, oh, it's probably nothing, you know, and made me, I just really felt for those people. And I mean, advocacy wise, I mean, obviously like always go get it checked, always like follow your, your intuition, you know, always, you know, go through the, go get the ultrasound, go get the biopsy, even if people are saying it's nothing. But then again, it's also like that stuff gets expensive. Women's health is a big issue. It's always an issue. And so for me, it's just kind of like being a physician. It's like, look, like once you get past that age of 30, you really got to start thinking about breast cancer screening, mammograms, ultrasounds, and things of the sort. And some people are going to say like, oh, no, it's not supposed to be until you're 40. There's a lot of people out there that are very objective and they kind of live by the numbers, right? Like 40, that's when you get your mammogram. Okay, fine. You get your mammogram at 40, but it doesn't mean you don't take care of yourself before that, right? She's feeling her chest, feeling her breasts, and she's clocking things in her head. Okay, it didn't go away. I'm going to give it another week. It didn't go away. All right, now I'm telling my doctor. Told the doctor. Doctor says, ah, I don't know. You know, it's probably nothing. Get an ultrasound anyway. Done, right? So she's having all of these tests done that are completely necessary. And quite frankly, I mean, it was stage one. And so we got lucky in that sense. I mean, I couldn't help but think about how many other women or men, I mean, there's male breast cancer, um, would go through what she went through and not tell a soul. Right. And then everything just happened. Then boom, it's stage three or it's stage four. Right. Which is a much worse prognosis. Well, and you time. hear a lot of stories like that. I mean, I've actually like now that I've I've said things publicly, I've had a lot of people I've been, you know, I have kind of a community that I talk to right now. And it's and it's kind of all the same thing. Like you're so young. It, it, the odds of it being that are so small, you know, and here they are like a year mm -hmm. later, much worse off because they were told it's, you know, you're so young. But the, the, the truth is that, I mean, breast cancer is, a, a, there's a lot of people that have breast cancer, it's the most right? most common cancer. In so even though the percentage of like people 40 and under is small, there's still a lot of people in that age group that yeah. will get it. You said your doctor said, oh, I don't think it's anything. What if, you know, someone goes to a doctor, oh, you know, and can you advise people how much of a, how pushy, they can be with uh, with medical people. Yeah, I mean, I think in that sense, when you feel something abnormal, when you see something abnormal, you investigate it, period, end of story. Um, and I think you just keep bringing that fact up. Like, listen, this is abnormal. We need to be invasive with this and we need to figure this out. That's, I mean, especially when you're a younger person. We tend to... You know, in medicine, and this is one of the mistakes, I think, in medicine overall is we tend to allow things to happen longer when you're younger. And then, you know, like when you're older, like if she were 55, it'd be like, oh, no, we got biopsy that like now. Right. I mean, it, and it's just I find it funny to me because I think it's backwards. I think it should be when you're younger. That's when you do all the invasive stuff. You're healthier. Your organs work. Everything's cool. Like that's when you do do the stuff, because that's when you'll make the biggest impact because you're being more proactive as opposed to being significantly reactive by waiting. I mean, and so that's one of the things that just came to my head thinking about all this, right? right. 
because I got two daughters. We have two daughters that we have to think about, right? And yeah, her cancer isn't the BRCA positive cancer, right? The genetic breast cancer you think about. But like her aunt had it, she had it. Like it may not be BRCA positive, but genetically my kids have to think about that. Right, there's a lot of different links that Thank you. Let's talk about your diagnosis. Can I have a technical diagnosis? Invasive ductal carcinoma. What's that? So invasive ductal carcinoma is a type of breast cancer. So there's many different types of breast cancers. Um, and basically, when you're thinking about a carcinoma, it's probably the most common type of cancer. Um, and so it's a cancer of the ducts of the breasts and it means that um, those cells basically became abnormal. Um, they started to invade the tissue that surrounds them. Um, like higher estrogen levels. So I'm estrogen positive. So now like one of the things is I have to be really careful about any kind of estrogen I put in my body. So that's vitamins, beauty products, um, foods that are high in estrogen. So there's um, a lot of things that I can Pregnancy. do on my own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's a hormonal, hormonal cancer. I did, I did, yeah. And I mean, there's certain things that I did that are supposed to lower your chances of that. And that's, you know, having babies before a certain age, um, breastfeeding. Yeah, I mean, I think, listen, like, None of us are immune to any of this stuff. Like all this stuff can happen to anybody. And like, are we ever gonna find a reason as to why a cell mutates and becomes cancerous? Like, no, like we're not. That happens all over the body all the time, right? So all your cells undergo mitosis. That means they divide, that means they split up. And when that happens, there's always a risk of mutations. And when you mutate, a cell can become really abnormal. And if it becomes really abnormal, it can gain function, lose function. Cancer cells gain function, right? They can grow all the time. And as the cancer cells grow, they try to take the same freeway system that white blood cells take to travel up and down the body, the lymph system. And then the cancer cells basically travel up and down the body and just kind of set themselves up wherever they want. And basically what happens is as they grow, they just take all the blood supply, they take all the energy from you. And that's eventually how a cancer kills you. But to be able to say that like, oh, we did this and so this happened. Like, it's a natural part of life. Everybody probably has a cancer cell or two within their body that the immune system kind of notices, surveys, keeps in check and gets rid of, right? It's just that in this case, it was able to proliferate a little bit. So tell me, so they say, you say you were stage one. Can you explain what that means? So it's a small tumor. It was one, it was only like 1.5. It was actually seven millimeters before it was biopsied. Once it was biopsied, the swelling basically increased the um, area that we all thought was tumor. But the initial, the initial nodule was seven millimeters. There you go. <laughs> okay. no, but, but that's not very big. And, it, and to be stage one means it has not spread. To it has to be a certain size. And then mm -hmm. it didn't spread to my lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. So... That's kind of how the staging works. The best of a bad situation is how I like to say it, because even though it is stage one, it's the options are just really, I mean, initially they just feel really awful. <laughs> Tell me how the kids felt once they actually, when it, be, it was no longer something theoretical, but it became something real. So I think we were nervous. Like we had, my mom was in town, his mom came. We were like, we're gonna have breakfast together and just just talk to the kids about it. And you, Jamie started the conversation and um, honestly they were in a super goofy mood. And I think we spent three minutes talking about it. 
and they were more concerned about me having surgery mm -hmm. than anything else. We we didn't say cancer, but you know, but I said it later on, and it was it was easy. You said it later on. Well, they know, but I mean, I said it gently, like just in passing. I'm like, you know, those mm -hmm. those bad cells that Daddy talked about. This is what. It's, you know, it's this, but it, but like you said, you knew this person and they were totally fine. And, you know, we're, we're a family. We can do hard yeah. things and we're going to be just fine. Yeah. I said, and that's exactly what we did. Yeah. I said they were bad cells and mom was going to get them cut out. But just to make sure she didn't have bad cells on the other side, they were going to cut out both sides. And that I had to tell the youngest one, who was five at the time, look, mom's not going to be able to pick you up. She's not going to be able to lay with you in bed. It's going to be daddy time. Um, that kind of thing. My eight-year-old, my older one, she understood. My younger one, a little bit different. So let's talk about the surgery and everything that, I mean, there was a lot that had to go on, right? So there, there was a lot that went on the very first week. So we saw the oncologist right away. She talked to us about some things that we probably would have to do. Chemo was pretty much off the table. Yeah, I mean, it was she still on the table. She never said it was off the table, but it wasn't going to be, it didn't seem like, she thought that was going to be the case. My options basically were radiation with a lumpectomy mm -hmm. um, or a single mastectomy or a double mastectomy. And for me, you know, we talked about it medically and Jamie basically was like, this is your body. Like you're going to have to make the decision. Like, and so for me, and I had talked at that point, like I was talking to other like breast cancer survivors that were around my age. And one person told me, she said, this is the hardest part. The hardest part is when you, when you don't have a decision made, but that moment that you make a decision, you're going to feel so much peace. And I did, I went back and forth and I was like, wait, all my options and with the lumpectomy and radiation, like there's potential for other cancers there's the potential for this cancer i mean my my risk is much much higher now or was if i didn't do what i did um and also uh you know this going to the female part of it like it would be um you know it would it wouldn't look the same they would look different so, um, you know, all of those things played a part of my decision, but I made the decision to do the double mastectomy. I mean, I didn't want the fear of it, like coming back. I didn't want to have to think about it. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to have to be over vigilant, like every few months, you know, going to get examined and all this stuff. So I just, I made the best decision for myself and for my kids. And how did that go? Tell me about what that was like. Um, emotionally very tough. The procedure itself or no, the surgery the idea or the of like, decision? No, the idea of chopping off a piece of your body. <laughs> it was very tough because in all honesty, they sever all the nerves. So there will never be like healing. Right. So that was a tough thing. Yeah. And this is the part that allowed me to become better at my job is this part because it's the part that we don't talk about right it's you you read these papers you read these articles and based on this evidence you make these decisions you're just like oh we're gonna cut this we're gonna do that we're gonna do that boom done like evidence says this outcomes better you're gonna be alive everything's cool done right but then there's this part Right, I mean, there's the part of, wait, you cut out my tissue and I can't feel my breasts anymore? Like, ever? Like, it's, it's done, it's gone? And it's like, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I didn't think about that beforehand. I never thought about that. I never did. That never even crossed my mind until she went through this. And that's the thing about being a you know, spouse that allows you to kind of to understand things a little bit more, you know? So that was the, um, uh, that's just something I just learned, you know? And it's, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean. In your, in your 
medical training experience, how often do they talk about um, female anatomy and sensation in female anatomy and, and the importance of that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm not going to sit here and say it's anybody's fault that I didn't think about it. I mean, when I took the test that I probably did well on, like I, I knew that there were nerves there. But it's, these are just aren't things that you think about in um, when we're drawing out diagrams and we're putting together kind of algorithms, like feeling is never included. And I don't mean just feeling in terms of nerves. I mean like feeling in terms of emotion. It's just not. It's, you know, when you look at med Twitter or anything, like medicine is very objective, right? And so it's, you know, it's, it's black or white, it's this or that. I mean, it, th that other stuff is not really there. And so, you know, it's just something that I think about a whole lot more nowadays than yeah. I, you know, when compared to before. Talk about how did you prepare for this surgery? Honestly, it happened so fast. Yeah. Like we made the decision three weeks later I had the surgery. Yeah. Um, I think I... We had no idea what to expect. When I... I mean, emotionally, like, I was a bit of a wreck, but I kind of bury it. And like I said, it's mm -hmm. triggered when <laughs> I You're feel pain. pain. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, I think I just got, I, I personally just get quiet and just, like, whatever. I just carry on. But I did, I did, as that person had told me, I did find the peace in my decision. I didn't look back. I didn't question. I didn't wonder if I was making the right decision because for me it was the right decision um I wondered but um yeah so day of surgery we went in at like 6 30 7 30 in the morning actually before that circle back we had to go in the Sunday before to do um the it was it the nuclear medicine injection yeah so we had to get a um at this this nuclear injection where they actually stick a needle in your nipple and inject you with stuff so they can find the tumor right and there was another procedure before that the anyway up until this point i had i had dealt with only women so we went in this time and the radiologist was a man the tech was a man and they had jamie sitting like way behind me and i'm in like the like uh, like on the machine and I, I like they had apparently there was a lady that came in too there but was she, but she never came to say hi to me she never walked over to say hi to me or anything so I didn't even know that she was there and I just I felt so violated at that moment I mean it was it was the weirdest feeling I'd ever had because they just opened it up they were these two men were just like over and I've never gone to a man like ob Gyn or anything like I've just always been women like women for my women's health <laughs> not that they're totally not I mean they did nothing wrong right it was my own like I just felt a little humiliated you felt uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. right I mean you feel uncomfortable yeah. when that kind of thing happens yeah. and I just you know you're still very much emotional and just angry about the situation and projecting a little bit probably and Story, I have a question just to, from my perspective. How did you say goodbye to your breasts? Um, honestly, and this is like kind of personal, but we went to Vegas and we went, we, I got, <laughs> I was like, Merry Christmas. We're going to Vegas for a night. Like, let's just have a bunch of fun. Yeah, right. And that was kind of my like, goodbye. yeah. So that was that, but yeah. <laughs> So, um, the surgery I was very anxious for, it was like a five hour surgery. Um, there's two different surgeons, there's the breast surgeon and then there's the plastic surgeon. Um, our main criteria, they were both wonderful doctors, but our main criteria was that they had worked together before. So they knew how to work with each other's work. Um, and so she came in first, the breast surgeon, and she comes in and clears out all the tissue. So it's an incision under the breast here. It goes from like medial out to lateral. And then it kind of like lift it up and then they scoop out all the tissue. And then they take like one lymph node. From they your, test one lymph node from your axillary region. 
And then if there's cancer in that, they'll, they'll, they'll keep going the until they don't find cancer anymore. But I didn't have any in there. And there's also a nipple saving mastectomy and then one where you take the nipple, take the nipple, but I was able to keep mine. Yeah. Cause her tumor was 10 centimeters away from her nipple. So they weren't worried about it. Mm -hmm. And then they put in, and the plastic surgeon puts in. So they're expanders. Tissue expanders, yeah. Um, they're super awkward and quite uncomfortable. But, um, it, you know, after the surgery, it, I mean, it was rough. It was a rough, like, pain. probably a good three weeks. And I feel like I'm young and healthy. <laughs> she was just her normal self maybe four days ago. Like yeah. Five days ago. I mean, she there's so much that you normal. do that you don't realize. Like, as much, I mean, I had to use my daughter's step stool to get on my bed because you can't use your hands. Like, you're basically like dinosaur hands <laughs> for a long time. And you have um, drains coming out of you. So, yeah. you're taking care of those. So, I mean, the aftermath was pretty rough, but you know, I've had two C sections, another surgery, and women are just. Oh, I badass so you know took some meds and and off those now and we're i'm feeling great i say like 75 percent so what's the prognosis for all this and tell me like what what they say like what do doctors say about all this so we're still waiting on one more test um which is called an oncotype test which will tell me my um chances of getting like a distant metastasis where you have breast cancer go to your brain or your liver or another organ somewhere. And based on that, we'll determine if I have to do some chemo, which we're not thinking that's the case. Um, if I need to get on a hormonal pill like tamoxifen, which is a really scary thought because some women have no symptoms. Some women, it throws them into menopause most women like it have can symptoms be, it can be pretty not great and that's like a 10-year thing i mean it just imagine taking this pill that like i'm not a woman but just inhibits everything that makes you a woman right it's an estrogen receptor inhibitor so everywhere yeah. estrogen it binds mood. to it, it affects sex drive it affects, affects all what your body is doing <laughs> right so I, I just, right now, I don't know where we are, but we're, you know, taking it day by day. And the process for doing the whole expanders, we went to our first appointment and basically, uh, or no, it wasn't the first appointment. It was, a, it was a couple appointments later. Um, the drains were in for about a couple weeks. They take them out in the office, which I thought would hurt, but hey, I have no feeling. So... <laughs> They didn't hurt, um, even though I still have pain, which is weird. I still have, I have the muscle pain. I have the muscle spasms. Um, I have the incision pain, um, stuff like that. But, um, and then they basically, when you're in the hospital, they put a little air in. And when you go to the, to your follow-up appointment, they take the air out and they start filling with saline. And the process is you basically go in a few times, they fill with saline until you are happy with where you are, and then you'll have your, like, your implant surgery. Oh, nice. So how, um, how are you feeling right now? That's a really tough question. I, I'm always, I think I'm back and forth. I mean, I feel like, I feel like emotionally I've come a long way because I'm happy with, like, the job they did, they did a really nice job. They um, they really did. They took a lot of care in their work, and I was afraid with that. Um, I had major anxiety about just going, being under for five hours, and so that's done and out of the way. So um, that was that was good. Um, and then, so I, so a lot of that, a lot of the anxiety is gone, but uh, we just have to figure out what this next step is, and you know. Have you done the like genetic testing on you? I mean, I know you said it wasn't the BRCA, so they obviously did we, some. Yeah, no, we did, and there, and there was there was no link. 
But as they say, there's still like they there's links have. that they don't have yet. So there could be one, but you just don't know. I mean, I'm like, I mean, it could be totally random or, but that was honestly like a huge thing for me, knowing that I didn't have Broca. the BRCA link because I immediately felt for my kids. Like I just felt sad. Now, one thing I will say, <laughs> leaving the oncologist the last time, she was like, just, you know, you got to live a mindful life. Think, keep that in your head now. Like now's the time to like, do things that are good for your like mental health, like quit stressing or, you know, just, just do things that are, you know, obviously the hormone, the uh, estrogen stuff, like the food, the beauty products, the vitamins, like I said earlier, but also just like stress and just live a mindful life, you know? So that's the point. Are you, are you succeeding at doing that? I think so. There's a new Amazon package at the door every day. So I think she's pretty mindful. <laughs> Yeah. yeah the, the right. Amazon. We all do it. We all do it. Okay, you guys, any final thoughts? Go get screened. All right. If you feel something abnormal, go get tested. Um, advocate for yourself. Think about the emotional uh, connection. Think about the emotional feeling of what it is your spouse or friend or whatever is going through. It's not just about the correct decision medically. Um, and then I think the other thing is like, you can be a spouse and be a physician or a healthcare provider. You just got to find that balance. You got to figure out how you're going to do that with your spouse. Um, I think that you do those things, you're going to be fine. No one is immune to this shit. Things happen, right? And we can continue to search for reasons as to why they happen. But the fact of the matter is, they happen. So when they show up, you deal with it, you absorb it, you get through it together, and you move on to the next day. Um, and you go from there. Thanks for joining Medicine Deconstructed. Thanks for having me. <laughs>